This video is sponsored by Classic Football Shirts, the best place to get your classic and vintage football shirts. To get cheap retro palace shirts, click the link in the description below. And for an extra 10% off, use the code CFSPJ10 at checkout. Hello and welcome to the e Crystal Palace podcast. I'm Alfonso Greenborough and in today's podcast, I'll be looking over the game against Brighton by bringing you my match review player rankings and my man of the match. As well as this, I'm also going to bring you interviews with Roy Hodgson, Wilfred Zaha, James Tonkins and Wayne Hennessy after the game. So let's begin. Palace's game of the season lived up to his billing as Wilfred Zaha Brace helped them to a 3-2 victory against Brighton and clinched a huge victory in the contents of the campaign. Unbelievably, all the scoring occurred in the first half, with Zaha grabbing an early lead for his side which was doubled by James Tonkins, but after Glenn Murray pulled one back, Zaha doubled his tally to put the Eagles back in control. However, Jose Escudero reduced the deficit before half-time which made for a nervy second half for all those in red and blue. But Roy Hodgson's team bravely held on to claim a massive victory, putting them just one point behind their opponents, but, more crucially, six points above the drop zone. Having waited 1,801 days for the visit of their bitter rivals, a sun-kissed Celis was boisterous as the teams entered the fray, and within five minutes of kick-off, the noise levels could be heard right across South London, as the Eagles took control proceedings by grabbing the opener. Andrus Tanza won an early corner, which Luka Milivojevic cleverly played short to Ruben off his cheek who in turn returned it to the Serbian. The skipper drove a short goal which was Matthew Ryan saved, but it dropped perfectly for Zaha to put home from a matter of centimetres to ignite a crazy opening 45. Roy Hodgson's team continued to press, and Townsend saw a fine chest and volley from distance cause Ryan issues, and an Aussie stopper could only bundle it around his post, but that would lead to the second goal in 14 minutes after an almighty scramble. Townsend whipped an excellent delivery into the box, which was met by the head of Tompkins, and his attempt was well blocked by the Seagulls keeper but the ball squirmed free. Eagles and Seagulls flocked towards it and eventually James McArthur was able to drive a shot goalwards which was stopped on the line by the hand of Shane Duffy but any controversy was avoided as Tompkins lashed home the rebound to put his team in firm control and it needed to be just four minutes later when Brighton pulled a goal back with their first attack. Once again a corner did the damage as Pascal Gross's delivery caused problems and Lewis Dunk was allowed a free header which he nodded towards the target and from a similar distance to Zaha's opener, Murray hooked the ball in off the bar to net against his former side for the second successive game. The jubilant home fans were stunned, but that feeling was fleeting as the crazy half continued in Palace's favour as a third goal in a 10 minute spell fell to the host. Milivojevic lofted a scoop pass into the area that was begging for someone to attack, and just as he famously did in a playoff semi-final five years ago, Zaha dived in and drove a header past the helpless Ryan to return Celos Park to his ecstatic state. Looking for his first career hat-trick, the Arvorin teased his way past Bong to hit a grass cutter at Ryan, but despite a lack of possession in the final third during the first half, Brighton's clinicalness dragged them back into the game again on 34 minutes. Lakeda held up the ball and was played in by the overlapping Escurero, who escaped past Joe Ward and bent a shot around Wayne Hennessy's dive, to find the far corner and net the Seagull second from just their two first half attempts on target. Only an excellent low stop by Ryan prevented Palace from taking a two goal lead into the break when Milivojevic had a go from distance, but while the half time whistle allowed everyone inside Silas Park to allow their blood pressures to drop, 15 minutes after play restarted, Palace's hearts were in their mouth when Murray stretched to reach Okaila pass but thankfully his shot trickled wide. It was also unlikely that the second half would match the drama of its predecessor, but while it had been lacking in goal math action, the nerves continued to build around the old ground as the minutes ticked by especially with the visitors creating the only chance of note and Palace's recent record of conceding late heartbreaking goals. Fingernails were being bitten with 8 minutes to go when Hennessy was forced to produce an excellent reaction save to deny Dale Stevens from long range after the Welshman had punched away a cross. And in stoppage time fans were peering through their fingers when a deep ball found Murray at the back post but he miskicked when well positioned and the chance went begging. But minutes later the relief poured in to the SC25 skies as the final whistle was blown handing the home supporters the chance to celebrate victory on their own patch for the first time since January at just the perfect time. (music) 
It was an incredible afternoon of drama as Crystal Palace recorded a much-needed win over their arch-rivals Brighton to move a step closer to Premier League safety. Two goals from Wilfred Zaha and a James Tonkin strike held the Eagles to a 3-2 win at Sellers Park as Palace moved six points clear of the bottom three with just four games to play. But what did we learn from the game? Here are five things. Number one, the Palace fans do have an extra gear. Prior to the game, Palace boss Roy Hodgson said that his side could not ask for any more from the supporters at Sellers Park but that he would be happy if they could somehow find an extra gear for the derby clash. And that they did early on, as the two teams emerged from the tunnels to a chorus of noise from all four sides of Sellers Park. The noise levels were so high, Palace's famous entrance music, Glad All Over, was almost drowned out. And they only rose again after Palace's blistering start in South London, which had the crowd bouncing. The ding-dong nature of the game meant emotions were up and down throughout the game, but the final whistle was met by the deafening roar from the home faithful the level of which had not been heard too often in SE25 in recent memory. Number 2. Fast Starters Sellers Park was rocking early on as Crystal Palace produced the fast start that it needed in a derby. The Eagles were quick out of the traps and fully deserved their early lead, with Zaha and Tompkins both on target from corners. Brighton's defending left plenty to be desired, but it was all action stuff from Palace and the visitors could not cope with the Eagles' blistering start. Brighton did get back into the game, but as Seagull's boss Chris Hewton admitted after the game, the damage was done in that incredible opening period. Number 3. Who else? It was almost inevitable that if Brighton were going to score, it would be former Palace striker Glenn Murray on his return to Sellers Park. And indeed it was the 34-year-old who hooked home from close range in the 18th minute as Lewis Dunk rose the highest to meet a Pascal Gross corner and direct it goalwards. It was his seventh goal of 2018 so far and gave Brighton a foothold in the game albeit briefly before Wilfred Zaha popped up to score with his head just six minutes later to restore Palace's two-goal advantage. Jose Escudero got the second goal for Brighton to keep the game alive, and Murray could have had a second in the second half, but saw one effort go inches wide at the post, before a cross in injury time seemed to catch him by surprise as he reached him over the head of a couple of players, bouncing off Murray as the chance went begging. Number 4. What is it about Brighton and Wilfred Zaha? Scoring a lead goals is a rare occurrence for Wilfred Zaha, Indeed, his first headed goal prior to this was, as you guessed it, against Brighton. He may have netted 18 goals in the Premier League before this, but he hasn't scored any with his head. He had also not scored twice in the same Premier League game either before this game. But that all changed here as he followed up his early tapping with a great header at the far post from Luka Milivojevic's cross to celebrate his first brace for Palace since that playoff semi-final clash against the Seagulls back in 2013. And number 5, the curious case of the defence. People often say that form goes out the window when it comes to derby matches and it seems that defending can be thrown into that mix too. Before this clash at Sellers Park, Brighton had only scored 7 goals away from home and only conceded 19 in 15 away matches. But that all changed here in a whirlwind first half as 5 goals were scored, the most in the first half of any Premier League game this season. Two of them were scored by the Seagulls, having only scored more than one goal away from home just once this season prior to this game. It was a different story in the second half as it became very nervy, but Palace just about hung on to claim the vital three points. I'm now going to move on to the player ratings, but before I start, don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Crystal Palace for all the latest Palace news. And also, if you're on Facebook, do feel free to join our Facebook group which is a really great place to join in with discussions and also share your opinions with other fans. And much like a forum, it's a great place to upload any videos, photos and any news articles you want to share with other Palace fans. Then of course you can do so via the Facebook group. Now of course if you do want to get you know, get all the latest Palace news, whether that be transfers, whether that be just quotes from the manager, whether that be the press conference, then of course do follow us on both our Twitter and Facebook pages which you can find at Crystal Palace if you do want to keep up to date with all things Palace and also do feel free to tweet us with your opinions as well because like I've said with the Facebook group we do like to have discussions and you know another place where it's a great place to connect with other fans is the Facebook group so if you are someone who likes to discuss things with other fans but also likes to read what other fans generally think about the team or about the club then of course do join the Facebook group because it's a great platform for you to do that. Now another great place to share your opinion is in the YouTube comments so if you are listening to the podcast on YouTube, then do feel free to drop a comment below the video with your play ratings, rating the players' performances from 1 to 10. Now obviously that's just so that I can come back to the video and rather than just having my opinion of the game, I can come back, look at the YouTube comments and actually see how you guys, the listeners, rated the players' performances and that gives me an idea of how everyone else thought the players performed because I've seen quite a lot of variation 
on Twitter. So it'll be good to hear your opinion and how your player ratings compare to mine. And even if you don't want to do that, and whether you're a Palace or even if you're a Brighton fan, you are just about welcome here. But do also comment below with your views of the game. You know, how good was Wilfred Zaha's goal? You know, why you think Wilfred Zaha only scores headed goals against Brighton? You know, how good you think Milivojevic's assists were? Anything like that that you do want to comment below, do feel free to do that below. And that's just so that obviously I can come back and see what the listeners thought. But also any Palace or any Brighton fans that also come to the podcast, they can also read your opinion and not only have my opinion from the podcast, but also they can read up and see what other fans generally thought about the game. So like I said there, if you do want to follow any of these social media pages or join the Facebook group, then do check all links that will be in the description below. But I'm now going to move on to my play ratings, starting in goal with Wayne Hennessy, who I am going to give a 7. No chance with the first goal conceded from close range and was well beaten by Jose Escudero for Brighton's second goal. Claimed some crosses was a commanding figure as the game went on. Pulled off a really good save down to his right to deny Dale Stevens. Booked for time wasting which was really harsh. Had an overall decent game. So Wayne Hennessy here, I've given him a 7. And much like what I've said in the last few weeks with his performances getting better and generally him not having much to do. This was another game here where actually he didn't have to necessarily have to do much in the game. But actually there were one or two fantastic saves to keep Palace in the game which were really important and I'll go on to talk about them. But in terms of the two goals we conceded, you know, it was an incredible first half of football. Five goals within about 30 minutes. So, of course, you can understand both defences and both goalkeepers not really having the best of the game when you consider two goals and three goals respectively. But I do think that Wayne Hennessy, for both of the goals, I don't really think he had any chance with them. You know, the first one was from very close range. You know, Sacco got pushed out of the way by Dunk and obviously he lost his marker. Joe Ward, who was meant to be marking Murray, lost him which obviously meant Murray was able to put it in from close range. So really for me, no chance for Hennessy with that goal. And obviously the second goal, once again, Joe Ward's mistake. Joe Ward tried to go into the sliding tackle, missed it, unlike someone like Aaron Wambisaka, probably would have made it, but I'll talk about that later. But obviously Joe Ward's missed the challenge, and obviously Esquerdo, fantastic, you know, curling effort past Hennessy. Even if Hennessy was at full stretch, which I think he almost was, he still wouldn't have been able to get there. So both of the goals, you know, one of them was mistake from Ward and Sacco. And then the other one was A, a good goal from Esquerdo, but also it was obviously a mistake from Joe Ward. So really for me personally, no mistakes from Hennessy for the goal there. You know, I've seen a few people slate him, but I personally think no blame whatsoever on him because it was individual defences errors there. But the thing that I really liked about his game and the reason I've given him a 7 other than them two fantastic saves he made was the fact that he was claiming crosses, you know, the fact that he was actually commanding his area and was being that figure in the back line was great to see. You know, you looked at one of the saves he made and straight away, obviously after making the save, he got up and he was shouting at Luca saying that's twice. So it's showing that actually he's not only now got the passion for the derby game, but also he's actually got that commanding aspect of his game he's actually telling players what they need to be doing because obviously that mistake if Hennessy had have made the save it would have been a goal so not only was he obviously claiming the crosses and was just being commanding but he was also being commanding not in the game aspect but also just in the fact that he was shouting at the defenders because there were quite a few times where our defense was a bit shaky you know towards the end of the game and you could see Hennessy getting up and screaming at the back four which shows that actually you know before he wouldn't talk to his back line and there was a miscommunication or whatever there was you know especially last season but actually now he's got this communication and he's absolutely rattling in uh, to the to the back four and obviously Luca in front of them which is good to see because I'd rather someone like Hennessy have that control of the back four and actually just tell them what to do rather than him not talking at all so it's great to see that and that's a real improvement to his game the fact that he's now uh, talking to the back four but then that really fantastic save he made you know there was a, a oh a, you know Brian player cut inside had a shot Hennessy was able to punch it away you know not the best punch but the fact that he got it out of the danger zone was good to see Hennessy's fallen to the ground and you know Dale Stevens on the edge of the area has gone to bang it and Hennessy's able to get back make a fantastic save and tip it behind for a corner so obviously a fan not the best um you know punch away to get the ball away but the fact that he was able to get the ball away recover then get down low enough again to you know uh, ben Dale Stevens' uh, shot, um, you know, for a corner was obviously great to see as well. Now, the only bad thing from his game is the fact that he got booked for time wasting, but I really think that was really harsh. I think that most teams goalkeepers do take their time with the goal kicks, and I do think, do correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think Saka was still on the ground or was getting up at that point. So of course, Wayne Hennessy doesn't want to take the goal kick until Sacco's in position and off the ground. So personally, for me, I think it was a very harsh um, card, but obviously. 
goalkeepers rarely ever do get booked, so it's not really going to affect his game that much, but just thought I'd say that that was quite harsh. But overall, I do think Wayne Hennessy, you know, had a decent game, you know, like I've said already, he was commanding in the area, came out for quite a lot of crosses, which I don't normally see him do, but he was incredible in terms of using his height to claim every single cross that was going into the box. Obviously, he made them few good saves, but much like the story has been in recent weeks, he weren't really tested that hard by the opposition, but he still, you know, when called upon, he was able to make these saves. But the one proper down thing about his performance was his kicking, you know. Obviously, he had a great performance. We won. We, he had the passion for the derby game, but the only downside was, was his kicking. You know, quite a few times, his goal kicks went out for touch, which obviously isn't ideal because you lose possession. But I'm sure Hennessy, having seen how good he is, uh, how or how long his free ki his free kicks and goal kicks can be, I'm sure that that was only a blip, and because there was quite a lot of wind, I suppose that could have an impact on it. But Wayne Hennessy here, a seven for him, two fantastic saves towards the end of the game, especially one on Dale Stevens, which was fantastic. No chance with either of the goals, and like I've said in recent weeks, he's now starting to command his area well, which is much better. And like I've said in you know in this summary for the game, he did came claimed quite a lot of crosses which of course was quite crucial to us defending well throughout the game so Wayne, Wayne Hennessy here a 7 for him. Now to move on to the right back Joe Ward who I am going to give a 6. Back in the side but was at fault for Albion's second goal. Beaten by Jose Escudero who finished into the bottom corner past Wayne Hennessy. Didn't really get into the game as much as he would have liked. So Joe Ward here have given him a 6 and before I go on to talk about his performance I've got to say that obviously Aaron Wambasaka played really well in the recent games and I personally didn't want him to be dropped. But of course, Joe Ward just come back from fit, uh, from his injury. He's now roughly, probably 100% fit. So he came back into the side. And personally for me, I would I would have liked to see him on the bench because I think that Aaron Wambasaka has deserved to keep his place in the side. But when you consider that Joe Ward has got the experience of a derby game, but also he's a much older player. So he's obviously got just the experience of big games like this. So personally for me, I can understand Joe Ward coming back into the side if Roy Hodgson done that for experience. But if he's just done it because Joe Ward's back available, then I don't quite understand that. And, you know, we saw in the game that, yes, he came back into the side. He didn't look 100%. And although he was actually getting to quite a lot of forward positions, I do think Ward was a little bit vulnerable at the back, especially with the pace of someone like Jose Escuero. Now, obviously, like I've said there, the pace of Escuero, Joe Ward did struggle with that. And the second goal that uh, Brighton scored, obviously... A great ball down to the wing by Brighton. Esquerdo's literally just literally walloped. Uh, you know, I, I say walloped. He literally just ripped Ward for pace. Ward tried to go in for a challenge, and uh, Jose's just literally overridden it. And then he's just curled it into the bottom corner past Wayne Hennessy. And as I said, Wayne Hennessy couldn't really do much there. So obviously, um, people have said that Aaron Wambasaka probably makes that sliding challenge, or because he's faster, he'd probably caught up with Esquerdo. Yes, that's probably true, and I'm, I'm sure that if Wambasaka was there, A, the player probably wouldn't have been able to run because of the pace, or being matched for pace with Aaron Wambasaka, but also I'm sure that Aaron Wambasaka, having seen how many clearances and how many tackles he's made in recent games, I'm sure he would have made a challenge there uh, to get the ball off Esquerdo. But personally for me, other than that, and other than the fact that he lost his mark, or he lost Glenn Murray for the first goal, there wasn't really anything bad from his game, so it wasn't like he was terrible because I thought like I've already mentioned I thought going forward I think he was quite impressive in terms of getting into the box and trying to put crosses in which is something we've been missing from his game you know beginning of the season we didn't see that but in this game here against Brighton he was running to the byline putting crosses in which of course was great to see and to be honest yes he didn't get into the game as much as he would have liked but you know like I've said already he's probably a bit rusty so you can understand him you know, not being the best. But like I've said, then two errors for the two goals we conceded isn't ideal. And personally for me, I would have liked Aaron Wambasaka to start. But obviously because of experience, he didn't. But I'm sure, you know, obviously Joe Ward wasn't terrible. But I would like to see Wambasaka come back into the team. Purely based on the fact that I think that he's just performed much better than Joe Ward has done this season. Now like I've said already, the mistake for the goal obviously involved him first. You know, failing to make a clearance or failing to get the ball off Escuero. So, like I've already mentioned there, and I talked about it earlier on in terms of the fact that there was five goals in 30 minutes shows that both defences were a bit shaky. But the fact that he failed to make a clearance or um, failed to tackle Escuero wasn't great. But on the plus side, after that goal, whenever the ball got to Joe Ward, rather than just faffing about, he had made qu he made quite a lot of clearances, which of course is making up for his mistake, which of course is what you want to see from a defender. 
But in terms of Aaron Wambasaka, there's nothing really for him to worry about long term because based on this performance here, it's either that Joe Ward isn't 100% fit yet or it's maybe it's just that Aaron Wambasaka, with him being a bit faster and a bit better at tackling, maybe he, he'll just be a better fit for the side. But personally for me, I'd like to see Aaron Wambasaka come back, back into the side purely because he's played much better this season and also just because Joe Ward looks a bit shaky at the minute and I'm sure that someone like Wambasaka, who's been playing so well against top opposition, he does certainly deserve to keep his place. But Joe Ward here, a 6 for him. Now to move on to the centre-back James Tonkins, who I am going to give a 7. Another close-range finish from the centre-back to put Palace 2-0 up in what was a dream start after Palace's opener. So James Tonkins here, I've given him a 7, and much like his performances have been this season, he's been absolutely solid at the back, and this game was no different, you know, in the derby game, he put in a fantastic performance, and personally was one of the players who was actually quite crucial in terms of helping us to win the game. Now in terms of you know, going away from his defensive performance. He scored another goal, which I think that gives him to three this season. I'm not sure. Do correct me on that. But he scored against Huddersfield a few weeks back. He scored here against Brighton. And although it wasn't the best goal, you know, it was a bit scrappy from the corner. You know, he orig originally headed it down. It got cleared. I think it was someone like Kabai was in the box. Went to try and hit it. MacArthur tried to hit it. And eventually it fell to Tompkins again. He made no, you know, no mistake. Rifled it into the bottom corner. Yes, it took a slight deflection off the hand of the goalkeeper, but a goal is a goal. It went in. So personally for me, you know, obviously we started the game so well, but that was just really just made it even better. The fact that we played so well and we were able just to capitalise on the Brighton defence just being quite lackadaisical and not really defending the corner properly. So although it was a bit of a scrappy goal, the fact that he's able to get into the area, win the header first hand, and even when the header doesn't come to him or doesn't come to a goal, he's still able to find the ball and put it into the bottom corner. So that was a really important goal in terms of putting us 2-0 up. Of course, we went on to win the game 3-2, and of course, we conceded two goals. But I do think at that point in the game, it was really important to make sure we could continue with that really fast-paced start. And of course, Tompkins scoring that was just a dream start and really just set the sort of set the theme for the rest of the game. But in terms of his defensive performance, obviously, he scored that good goal. But if you go to the defensive side, like he always does, he won loads of, won loads of headers. You know, he's always putting in loads of challenges as well, you know, tackles and blocks. So everything that he normally does, he'd done in this game and made sure that we could, in a derby atmosphere, we could still win the game. And like I've said already, he was really important in terms of us winning this derby game. But also the thing that I pick up every week is just that he's a good partner for Sacco. You know, Sacco is a fantastic defender. Yes, he has a few mad moments, but alongside Tompkins, they form a really good partnership. And obviously alongside the likes of Luca and Zaha obviously scoring the goals, you know, I do think the defence, especially the two centre-backs, was really crucial in terms of us getting anything from this game because against your rivals, you've got to stay calm, you've got to stay, stay level-headed. And I do think that Tompkins, alongside Sacco, did do that. But his overall performance, you know, there's not really much I can say about him because I say it week in, week out. But another solid defensive performance from James Tompkins, you know, winning headers, putting blocks in. And, you know, once again, just the the good goal, you know, it may be a scrappy goal, but it's an important goal for us. And the fact that we've got our striker now, or our winger scoring goals, we've got Milivojevic assisting and scoring goals, and we've got a defender who's scoring goals, that's what you need. You need goals, not necessarily from one player, but from all around the pitch. So, of course, his defensive performances are great, but the fact that he can chip in with the odd goal here and there is, of course, great to see as well. But, you know, do comment below with your thoughts about James Tompkins. And personally for me, you know, I've said this last week, but he is one of the high nominations for the player of the season. You know, we've got the likes of Milivojevic and, of course, Zaha, who probably will be, you know, top of that list in terms of the nominations. But I'm sure Tompkins has got to be up there because his performances this season have been absolutely fantastic. And this was another game here where he may not have been fantastic conceding two goals, but I still do think actually... In terms of his overall defensive play, other than the goals, and the fact that he can chip in with a few goals, was really crucial. So James Tompkins here, a 7 for him. Now to move on to the centre-back, Mamadou Sakho, who I am going to give a 6. Didn't really put a foot wrong. He did alright in the first half. Made a great block to deny Murray just inside the box. So Mamadou Sakho here, I've given him a 6, and although I said that his partnership with Tompkins was... A really good partnership, really, really strong defensively. Although that was the case, I do think in terms of the two defensive players, I think Sacco had a slightly, not necessarily worse performance, but he had a lesser performance. And that's why I've given him a 6 as opposed to a 7. Now, realistically, you know, he didn't really put a foot wrong. So it's not other than sort of losing his marker dunk for the corner for the first goal. Other than that, I don't really think he was at fault for, the, for anything in the game. And I thought he defended fairly well. 
But like I've said already, you know, sometimes players let, let, make little mistakes like Ward with that the goal and like Mamadou Saka here. So really for me, he didn't really put a foot wrong other than losing his marker at the corner. But when you consider Lewis Dunk did push him and that should have been a free kick to Palace, even though that was the case, I'm not really going to dwell too much on that. And, you know, in the first half as a whole, you know, lots of pressure, five goals within half an hour, quite a lot of pressure on that game. And I do think he done all right in that in that first half. And the thing that I did pick up from his game, you know, this was in the first and second half, is that I, I, su I suppose you could describe it as a maverick performance because there was quite a lot of the times where Sacco, much like Tompkins, was making fan winning all of the headers, making fantastic challenges. And there were other times where he was making clearances which weren't going far enough and were being intercepted or he was just recklessly clearing it and Brighton got possession. So there were a few times where he, you know, he was, you, you know, he wasn't really doing the right things he weren't making the right decisions but there were other times where he was absolutely fantastic and that's the main reason I can't give him a seven it's just the inconsistency because if he had been fantastic throughout the whole game yes he would get a seven but the fact that he had a few moments where he he cleared the ball not properly or he made a wrong pass and he passed it to a Brighton player stuff like that of course is not ideal and if he hadn't have made them little mistakes or them little uh you know lacks of concentration then of course I probably would have given him a seven because I certainly do think that his performance did deserve that but there was one block in particular which was absolutely fantastic and personally if it wasn't for the mistakes for the goal and a few of them passes he probably would have got a seven just for this block just just for this block in particular now we saw against Liverpool a few weeks back where he put his body on the line stopped Mohamed Salah and he'd done exactly the same here you know Glenn Murray against his former side obviously he scored the first goal but he had a few chances well he had a hat-trick of chances in the second half yes he missed all of them but one in particular Sacco dived in front of the ball got in the way of it and just made made sure he could do everything he can to stop Murray getting that shot away and that's exactly what he did you know Mamadou Sacco made sure he was careful not to handball the ball inside the box managed to dive down get his body in the way of the ball and made sure that it wouldn't bounce over him so obviously that Murray could just jump over him and of course because our defensive performance and organization was there once Sacco had made that block there was a defender there straight away to clear the danger so you know yes I said about Tompkins scoring a goal that's one of the good things about his performance and in terms of Sacco yes it wasn't a great performance much like Tompkins but I do still think that crucial moment in the game could have made it 3-3 but instead like he always does he puts his body on the line and gives his all for the team which was of course great to see. Now really just to summarise his whole performance here you know I've given him a 6 because he didn't really put a foot wrong other than the goal we conceded and of course that great block to deny Murray. But overall in the game, you know, if you're looking at his whole defensive performance, I thought he put in loads of good blocks here and there. And of course, we was winning loads of headers. And for the majority of the game, he was quite calm headed. You know, in the derby atmosphere, you can understand a few players losing their heads. He stayed calm. And most of the, most of the time, you know, when he was playing the ball out from the back, he was quite calm and played it pretty well from the back. And other than them few passes which he missed or he gave to wrong, the wrong players, other than that, I thought his overall game was quite calm. And like I said, and I say this every week, you know, he's a fantastic player, Sacco. He has some shaky moments as well, but I still do think he's a, there's a fantastic player hit, um, there. And, you know, with him alongside Tompkins, they're forming a really great partnership. So if Sacco can be as fantastic as we know he can be and as fantastic as he is, and he can just get rid of these shaky moments and lacks of um, concentration and just keeps calm, then I'm sure there's going to be even better performances from him coming soon. But Mamadou Saka here, a 6 for him. Now to move on to the left back, Patrick Vanano, who I'm going to give a 7. Fairly solid at left back, not too much trouble to deal with. Brilliant cover back when Joe Ward found himself in a 2 on 1 situation at one point. So Patrick Vanano here, I've given him a 7, and much like his form has been over the last month, it was another fantastic game from him, not only defensively, but going forward, I still thought he'd done his fair bit of attacking. Now in terms of his performance as a left back, you know, I said already, uh, in, you know, in terms of the defensive performance, yes, we conceded two goals within the first half an hour, but I do think that as it was a derby game, the sort of nerves got to both teams. And of course, we conceded the two goals and Brighton conceded the three goals. So basically the whole defence and the whole back four of both sides was a bit shaky. And I do think that Patrick Van Aanholt, I think he was fairly solid. You know, he wasn't fantastic in this game like he's been in past games in the last month but I still thought he was fairly solid in that role. Now to be honest one of the reasons why he probably wasn't fantastic is purely because he wasn't really tested uh, throughout the game you know most of Brighton's attacks 
came down the right hand side because they were exploiting that weakness in Joe Ward. So realistically, Patrick Van Aanholt's not really going to have too much to deal with. And because of that, and because he's not having any trouble dealing with the attacking players, it was a quite an easy game for him. And of course, because of that, and because most of the attacks were focused on Joe Ward, he obviously got the freedom to go forward slightly more. And I do think that although he necessarily didn't put in any killer crosses or any shots like he normally likes to do, I still thought that actually his contribution both defensively and offensively was quite crucial to the team. Now, of course, Joe Ward, you know, he, I've already said already he wasn't fantastic in the game. But there was one point where Brighton counter-attacked a Palace corner and Joe Ward, I think, and Tompkins were the only players back. I may be wrong there, but they were the only two players back. Obviously, Tompkins has got done for pace, I believe it was, or whoever that player was. So, of course, Joe Ward was there trying to, you know, catch up with the, with the attacker as well. He also loses him. But Patrick Van out there, just as Wayne Hennessy's going to dive to, you know, pick up the ball, Patrick Van Aanholt's able to take it away from the defender, take it to the corner flag. And although he should have cleared it, as he went to clear it, it deflected off a Brighton player right into the path of Glenn Murray. But of course, Mamadou Sacco made that fantastic block. So although it wasn't great in the end, the fact that he was still able to provide that cover and use his pace to get in behind when Joe Ward, you know, had no cover there. The fact that he was able to get in behind, make that block or take the ball away from the attacker was great. And although his final cross or his final pass wasn't fantastic in terms of deflecting it right into the path of Glenn Murray that's what the whole defence is there for and obviously Mamadou Saka was able to clear up from that as well so really for me the fact that he was able to be good defensively but also offer some sort of threat going forward with his pace and of course using the pace defensively as well that was of course great to see now really for me you know I've already said already you know over the last sort of month or so you know we're looking back to like the Chelsea game for example the Manchester United game he was absolutely fantastic in them games and you know he started to grow with confidence and I do think he's a very much a confidence player much like a few players in the side and I do think at the moment he's at his best of his game and long may it continue because it's great to see his performances at the moment but he is a class player and long may it continue. Now one thing I do want to pick, out, uh, pick up about his performance is something which relates to the beginning of the season and is the complete opposite of that because against the in you know against Bristol City we lost 4-1 that was a completely uh, you know horrible defensive performance you know from the goalkeeper from the back four terrible terrible defending from the whole team but mainly the defense and personally for me Patrick Van Aanholt got a lot of the fault for it because one of the goals was his, his fault because he tried to head the ball back to Hennessy and of course it got intercepted so since or bef you know after that game in the aftermath quite a lot of people were blaming him saying he doesn't read the game well he's a really bad defender we should sell him in January but after that game, he's obviously had his injury, managed to pick himself back up. And since then, he hasn't looked back and his performances have been drastically getting better. And at the moment, he's at the best he's ever been for Palace. You know, I've, you know, the beginning of last season or the end of last season, he had a few good performances here and there. But personally for me, you know, how he's been performing in the last month since that Man United game is absolutely phenomenal. And he's personally, in my opinion, one of our most informed players at the moment. But, you know... At the beginning of the season, people were criticising him defensively, and rightly so because of the defensive mistakes. But I personally think, unlike at the beginning of the season, what I've seen in the last month, and especially here against Brighton, he reads the game really well, which of course was great to see. He's got the pace to not only get forward, but also to get back and defend. He's calm on the ball, you know, none of this panic crossing or panic clearances. He's quite calm on the ball and likes to play it out from the back. And like obviously playing it out from the back, in order to do that, you need to be very good on the ball. And he's obviously good at playing it out from the back. But also putting crosses into the area is another asset he has. So, you know, Patrick Van Aanholt here, you know, although he wasn't fantastic and was the the person who changed the game for Palace, he wasn't that match changer. But I do still think his performance was quite crucial, both defensively and offensively. You know, you look at the chances he had going forward, they were quite crucial. And in terms of going back, you know, that time in particular where Joe Ward was 2-1, on one, or one, sorry, one on two, because obviously two Brighton attackers. The fact that Van Aanholt was able to use his pace, get in behind, take the ball to the defender, was of course great to see as well. So, Patrick Van Aanholt here, the left back, a seven for him. Now let's move on to the captain and midfielder, Luka Milivojevic, who I'm going to give an eight. Assist for Zaha's opener. Picked up a silly booking just before Brighton's first goal, but got another brilliant assist for Zaha again to make it 3-1. So Luka Milivojevic here, I've given him an 8 and before I go on to talk about how good his defensive performance was and you know, to be honest, I'll be repeating what I say every week, week in, week out but I've just got to say the two assists for both of Zaha's goals were absolutely fantastic. Now, I've said previously, you know, in the last month or so I've seen him 
go forward a lot more and I've seen him put a lot more through balls and long balls than obviously what we saw last season because he was definitely under Sam Allardyce he was being used as a, a, def a defensive midfielder not to move out of that his own his own area and of course because of that he didn't really have the chances to go forward but under Roy Hodgson he's still obviously a defensive midfielder and spends the majority of the time in Palace's half of the field but when he does go forward as he's shown in recent games he can obviously pick out a good pass but also obviously a good shot as we saw against Southampton. So now he's not only starting to tell us and show us how good he is defensively, but actually going forward he's showing us actually what a, quite a good of an asset he is with his passing ability. Now in terms of Zaha's first goal, obviously that was a brilliantly worked corner in terms of Luka, passing it to Loftus-Cheek which draws the defender out. That means that he can do a 1-2 with Loftus-Cheek, picks up the ball again, rifles it across the front of goal. I think Ryan makes the save but he only deflects it on the line and of course Wilfred Zaha, man of the moment, able to tap it in and that's 1-0. So of course Luca was quite instrumental in that in terms of getting the assist for that but also he was the guy who'd done that 1-2 with Loftus cheek to create the space so he could rifle that shot across goal and of course Zaha was there to make sure it went over the line. So of course that was a really work, a really well worked routine and of course they worked they must have worked in it on a training ground in terms of exploiting Brighton's weaknesses in terms of defending from corners and then in terms of after that he obviously picked up a silly booking you know not much to talk about there but you know it with it being a derby game of course a few players put in a few reckless tackles but in terms of that he got booked for that which is fair enough I think it was a foul but if you look at some other players you know I'm sure there were a few other players who should have got booked from Brighton and should have been red carded when you consider five six seven tackles that they made at least five of them being yellow card offenses so when you consider Luca got booked for this which I would say yes it was a silly booking but it was a fair yellow card I'm sure other players did deserve to get booked but in terms of the other assist for Zaha's goal obviously to make it 3-1 another fantastic assist you know the balls bobbled around in the edge of the area Kabayes tried to cross it into the area it deflects out to Luca. Luca takes a touch tries to drive forward looks up and then looks again sees the run of Zaha pings it up in the air fantastic weight on it fantastic spin on it back to Zaha Zaha runs on side which we we haven't seen a, a lot this season because most of his runs have either been incorrectly marked offside or have just been offside this one was time to perfection uh, time to perfection fantastic lofted ball by Milivojevic and of course Zaha was able to head it home so not only was Luka defensively solid in this game, but the two assists, you know, the brilliantly worked corner and the fact that he floated that ball perfectly for Zaha to score was, of course, great to see. But, you know, like I say, nearly every week now, he is a class act, you know. Not only was he making, you know, superb, superb tackles and blocks in that first half and especially in the second half when we were under pressure, but also he was able to get forward and, of course, give the assist for both for both of Zaha's goal but to be honest if you look back at the stats you know I got a bit confused with my stats last week if you listened to the podcast but if you look back at it in the last four games he's had he scored three goals and got two assists which really just shows people say that Zaha's our best player and our main player but if you look at it actually realistically in terms of contribution in terms of just pure assists and goals Luke has got to be up there in terms of being involved in five goals in his last four games which is a really impressive thing for a defensive midfielder but to be honest you know I thought he was fantastic in this game you know making blocks making tackles the passion as well in terms of captain in the side the passion for the derby was of course great to see and another thing as well is you know just overall his shielding of the back four I was really impressed with that because in a derby game obviously Brighton want to win this game and Palace want to win this game so we were quite open at the back but I do think that Luca done a really great job as, along with the defence in terms of you know restricting Brighton and their chances but in terms of you know the only negative you know I've given him an 8 because he was absolutely superb in this game but of course you know he held a player back that's a yellow card obviously a few early fouls as well he got but you know yes it's a yellow card a bit of a silly one but you know at the end of the day take one for the team in the derby and at the end of the day he didn't get sent off so you know that's all great you know he took a yellow card for the team and that's it. But Luka Milivojevic here, an 8 for him, a fantastic captain's performance, you know, leading the side with pure passion, passion and determination. And once again, two fantastic assists for Zaha, and once again, another fantastic defensive performance. So Luka Milivojevic here, an 8 for him. Now to move on to the midfielder, Johan Kabay, who I am going to give a 6. Battered away, neat and tidy, anonymous in the second half, and was substituted for Benteke. 
So Jan Kabai here, I've given him a 6, and although he didn't really necessarily have any massive impact on the game in terms of what Luka did with two assists and, of course, you know, fantastic defensive play, I do actually think Kabai was one of the most crucial players in terms of us getting this win against Brighton and you know the things that I picked up on you know I've already said in that introduction but he battled away so he was giving his all for the team running all over the pitch even though he may have lost his legs he was neat and tidy with his passing you know quite a lot of the time he was the guy you know to start up attacks spread the ball out wide and he was the one linking the defense to the mid uh, to the attackers you know with his great passing ability and of course the only untidy piece of passing was when he tried to pass the ball it deflected off a Brighton player and of course then Luca pinged the ball forward for Zaha so realistically if you look at his contribution in terms of passing everything was great and even when he did misplace one of his passes it still resulted in us getting a goal which really just highlights how good his influence was from passing position now in terms of the second half he was slightly anonymous in that second half you know he didn't really necessarily have any impact and rightly was taken off i think it was the right time to bring benteke on because at that point we were trying to protect our one goal lead you know at three two and of course we were pinging loads loads of ball for, balls balls forward so rather than just having two wingers playing up front bring on a tiger man in benteke and of course because kabai's legs are slightly going of course take him off and you know not to say that he had a bad game but just because he looked a bit fatigued towards the end of the game brought him on but i do or brought him off i think it was the right time though to bring penteke on because it gave us a little bit more of a focal point in the game but i do think you know kabai even though he may not have been fantastic in this game i still think he was a workhorse on the side and although you know most people will put his you know won't really look at his performance that much but i do think his role and his sort of running and his pressing of the opposition was really integral to us winning the game now in terms of the first half like i've already said he ran the game in the first half, you know, alongside Luca playing in that defensive, you know, that defensive two in front of the back four. I thought he'd done a fantastic job in terms of running the game and controlling that midfield battle. And when you consider Brighton were playing a midfield three, they looked lost because they didn't know which players to mark. And it sort of it was a mismatch between our sort of two defensive midfielders and two wing or narrow wingers as such, you know, in Calf and Loftus Cheek. So because of that, Brighton's defense or Brighton's midfielders were a bit confused. And that meant we had total control of the game. And certainly Kabai was one of these players who took advantage of that and really dominated and controlled that midfield really well. Now, of course, you know, the only downside of his performance is the fact that he could, he could only last 70 minutes. But when you consider that, as soon as he went off, they were brought and put on a bit more pressure and had a slightly more domination over Palace in the later stages of the game, really just highlights how important Kabai was that as soon as he went off, Bryden had once again got a foothold in the game which really just highlights the importance of Kabai even though you may not see it in terms of goals and assists the fact that he went off and Brighton got a little bit more control just shows how good his performance was because much like Luka it wasn't only his defensive tackles and blocks which were important to the game but just his pressing and his running in the midfield was of course great to see so personally for me you know there's not really much and not really too much to say about Kabai's performance here but I do think a six is a fair reflection of his performance. Now to move on to James MacArthur who I am going to give a seven. Good energy and kept it up but had no say going forward in the first half better in the second half. So James McArthur here, I've given him a 7, and much like his performances have been recently in terms of him being quite integral to the way we play in the midfield, whether that's him playing out wide or down the middle, I think he's a really important player to the way we play, and once again here against Brighton in a massive game, he showed once again what an asset he is to the side, and you know, before I go on to talk about his performance, you know, it's been rumours that he's, his contract is end at the it was ending at the end of the season, but there's also rumours saying that He's already got a new contract extension, but whatever the issue is, uh, or whatever the stance is regarding that, if he hasn't got a contract and we need to renew it, certainly do that because performances like this show what an important player he is to the side and why we need to renew his contract or keep him at the club because he's going to be quite important for us. Not only at the end of this season, but in, in terms of going forward, I do think he'll be a, a really good asset for us. Now, in terms of his performance here against Brighton, you know, much like the whole team, they were all raring to go. And we saw that in in MacArthur's performance in terms of the energy he had. And unlike someone like Kabai who started the game really well and obviously dipped towards the end of the game and then got taken off. MacArthur had really high energy, really good energy and kept it up for the whole game which is of course great to see. You know consistency along the whole 90 minutes is great to see and it just shows how good of 
an engine or, or how much of an engine he's got in terms of how he plays which really just highlights once again how important he is for us but in terms of the first half because obviously Wilf and Tompkins scored the goals there wasn't really any attacking influence from the midfield other than the pass from Luca to score the the first or the first and third goal so other than that the midfield weren't really invo involved and certainly in MacArthur's case because we were trying to defend deep and stop Brighton obviously he didn't really have a say going forward but in the second half because we obviously had that lead and because obviously Kabai and uh, you know Luca were playing slightly deeper MacArthur did improve and got better in the second half and he did play slightly further forward which of course was great to see and you know once again you know if he's a player who is going to play this high press, allow him to do it for the whole game because it's really effective. Because much like Kabai did, you know, Kabai may not have had the mass, the most influence on the side, but his pressing game alongside MacArthur's was really important in terms of A, winning that midfield battle, but B, actually stopping and restricting Brighton's attackers from actually getting at us. So, you know, the fact that we were able to put pressure on them as well as the Brighton defence was, of course, great to see. And I suppose what MacArthur brought was the much needed energy and pressing into the team and that's something that he's renowned for and something that he's very good at but like I've said you know unlike Kabai where Kabai had to go off in around 70 minutes the fact that MacArthur can do what we need in terms of having energy and pressing and the fact that he can last for 90 minutes once again shows what a fantastic asset he is to the side but the only downside to his game, and this is obviously, you can't really do anything about this, but he's got loads of energy, that's fantastic, he presses the opposition, but he hasn't got much pace. And imagine how much more of a, a midfield engine he would be in terms of having the stamina, having this energy, and if, if he had a little bit more pace, how dominant he would be in the midfield. And that's his only downside, nothing can really help him with that, you know, he's 30 years old, not really going to be the fastest player. But the fact still remains that the fact that he's still got this energy and pressing ability is fantastic and we saw that in his game here against but crucial to that because his pressing to the Brighton back line and of course the Brighton attackers as well that pressure and that pressing obviously gave Brighton less space to attack or to defend as well so they had to make rash decisions but also of course it gave us that control of the midfield which was quite good to see so once again MacArthur not only proven what an asset to the side he is but also how much influence he can have in a game and a good performance from him once again so James MacArthur here a performance of good energy first half wasn't great but the second half was better a 7 for him now to move on to Ruben Loftus-Cheek who I'm going to give a 7 some promise but could do a lot more to get into it no drive in the first period. Improved a bit as the game went on. But this might be a slightly controversial one in terms of giving Ruben Loftus Cheek a 7. And certainly for me, I was debating whether to give him an 8 because I do think his performance did warrant it. But personally for me, there were a few moments in the game where he was absolutely fantastic. You know, much like Sacco in terms of making that block. So Sacco was absolutely fantastic or he was good until a few of the little mistakes he made. And Loftus Cheek was similar to that. And it wasn't that Loftus Cheek made mistakes. It's just that some parts of the game he was absolutely phenomenal. Some could say world class in terms of his ball carrying ability. And there were other times where he went a little bit quiet and a bit anonymous. And didn't really have as much impact as he would have liked. But the thing that I liked about his performance here is the fact that actually the bad sides were completely outweighed by the fantastic performance he put in for the majority of the game. You know I'm going to say 99% of the time his performance was good. But there are a few times where he may have been switched off and not as good as he could have been. Now that's not to say that he was necessarily bad. Things such as lacking stamina, that's not, not necessarily great. But the fact that he can play so well is of course great to see. And of course, much like his performance was last week, you know, he wasn't the greatest but he was still good. He came into this game here and unlike that performance against um, Bournemouth, it was a much better performance. And once again, he showed a bit of promise. And although he could do a little bit more if he got into a few better positions, I still thought the fact that he showed promise and he was as good at, with the ball carrying as he was, was of course great to see as well. Now of course in the first half, much like MacArthur, he didn't really have the best attacking influence. You know, He wasn't really involved in most of our attacks and unlike the second half where he was carrying the ball and you know brushing past defenders left, right and centre, linking up with Vanana or Wilf on the wing, we didn't really see that in the first half because he had no drive. But in the second half, he improved drastically and was absolutely fantastic. And all I've got to say really for here is that he's an awesome footballer, got huge bits of potential. And the thing that I liked about his performance here, and the, the reason I've given him a 7, is that he worked harder than he usually does. And that's the thing I like about his performance. The fact that he's 
not only going back and doing his defensive contribution, but even though he's playing out wide, he's still linking up with the fullback and the striker, as in Zaha. And he was still doing these lovely link ups, going forward, driving the ball forward, and getting into the area, which of course is what you want to see from your attacking midfielder. And of course, that was great to see. Like I've said already, the only downside could be the fact that he lacks stamina, but when you consider he's just come back from injury, you know, you can understand him. Uh, going off in about this well I think it was probably about the 80th minute or so so you can understand him doing that and I'm sup I personally think if he was on the pitch for longer he probably would have got an eight for his performance but just the fact that he lacked that little bit of stamina and he wasn't as good in the first half as he was in the second half you know first half was all right second half was fantastic so when you compare the two I do think that a seven is a fair reflection of the game and when you consider how well he played I do think even though people have given him uh, eights I, I do think, personally for me, a 7 is a fair result. But do feel free to comment below whether you do disagree with my opinion. But also, you know, do comment below what you think about Loftus-Cheek. Because an article came out late last night. So I'm recording this on Monday. On uh, Sunday night, an article came out about Loftus-Cheek. And it was Roy Hodgson talking about the possibility of signing him in the summer. And he basically said, and it was in an interview with Loftus-Cheek as well. Loftus-Cheek was saying... I'm enjoying my football here at the minute. The passion, the drive, the determination to win is fantastic and it's helping me to learn. The fans, the passion is fantastic. And basically he was saying, yes, I want to go back to Chelsea, but at the moment I'm concentrating on Palace. I'm enjoying the time here. And then Roy Hodgson later on said that actually, once we're confirmed safe in the Premier League, obviously he'll allow Loftus Cheats to go back to Chelsea and discuss his future. But Roy Hodgson will 100% be open to signing Loftus Cheek on a permanent. And basically... You can look it up online, but the quote says from Roy Hodgson, it's basically something along the lines of, "Whether we're in the, when we're, um, if we are in the Premier League next season, we will of course discuss it with Chelsea. He's a fantastic player with fantastic ability and should be going to the World Cup. So something like that. The fact that the manager Roy Hodgson is talking about the possibility of signing Loftus Cheek on the permanent deal, if uh, he can, you know, if he doesn't have a chance at Chelsea and if they're able to agree a deal and obviously providing we're safe in the Premier League." The fact that he's talking about this now has got to be promising because he'll be a fantastic buy. And, you know, whether he's 25, uh, 30 million, whatever it is, I think we do have to pay for it. Obviously, we've got other transfer targets, but if it is 25 million, just pay it because he's a fantastic footballer. It could be a fantastic asset for us going forward. And in terms of the World Cup, putting in performances like this for Palace is, of course, going to boost his chances because you've got the likes of Jack, Jack Livermore, who are in the England side, you know, Lalana before he got injured, you know, you've got people in the England squad who realistically, just because they play for big clubs, they're in there. When you've got someone like Loftus Cheek, who's performing as well as he is alongside Townsend, so you've got two players here that do, who would deserve to go in the England England squad. So certainly, if they do carry on with performances like this, then they do fully deserve it. But Loftus Cheek here, a seven for him. Now to move on to the striker Andros Townsend, who I'm going to give a seven. Burst here and there in the first half, kept going and showed some more threat in the second. So Andrus Townsend here, I've given him a 7, and much like what I said with MacArthur in terms of just having an absolute engine and just running for the whole game, this is basically what Townsend done for the whole game, and it was really effective. Now, I talked last week in terms of the front two, so the 4-2-2-2 two, 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 if you may, or the 4-4-2, four, four, whatever formation we were playing against Bournemouth, I personally thought that even if Benteke and Solo are both fit, I think we should stay with the same system because it worked really well. And as shown here against um, against Bournemouth, sorry, against Bournemouth, as shown against Bournemouth, and obviously here against Brighton, actually it's a quite an effective system, although it isn't perfect. I do think that Andros Townsend and Wilfred Zaha playing up front was really effective. Now, in terms of them playing up front, you know, because they're not orthodox strikers, they kept drifting out wide, and because of that, Bournemouth. Uh, Sorry, I keep saying Bournemouth, but I mean Brighton's defenders kept getting confused and they kept getting dragged out wide and they didn't know who didn't know who to mark and that resulted in us scoring the two goals or scoring three of the goals, but two of them in particular, both from Zaha, purely because the defenders didn't know which striker to mark, purely because obviously they were playing further out wide, then drifting inside. So that confused the back the back four of Brighton and obviously resulted in us actually creating quite a lot of chances and certainly Townsend was really important for that. But in terms of his pace and his just pure energy, we saw it burst here and there in the first half. You know, he wasn't necessarily fantastic in the first half. And unlike Wilf, obviously, who's got the two goals, Townsend didn't really get to see much in terms of attacking for it. But I do still think in terms of pulling the defenders out and confusing them by playing up front, I think he done a really, really great job of that, especially in the first half. 
But in the second half, he improved drastically. What was probably one of our most attacking players, you know, using his pace to get inside. And obviously, where we didn't necessarily have a striker up top, obviously Townsend normally would play out wide and put crosses in. Because of that, he obviously had to try and get the ball from deep, go forward and start up attacks. And I thought he'd done that really well as well. Now, another thing I picked up was the fact that because he... For quite a lot of the games, Zaha was the main guy playing up front before Benteke came on. So because of that, quite a lot of the time I, I found personally that Townsend came back, defended, you know, would help the fullbacks, would double up on Brighton's attackers. And because of that, it obviously restricted them to as little chances as possible. And that's obviously great to see from a winger that they're not only doing their forward roles, but also they're going back and defending. And that's something I liked about Townsend's performance because not only was he using his energy and his pace to actually go forward but also he's using it to go back and help the team with their defensive unit and that's obviously great to see but in terms of his first half you know I already said he was effective but not necessarily having as much impact as Zaha but in terms of the second half I thought he kept going he showed a lot more threat in that half and he worked really hard for the team and that's why I've given him a seven you know I didn't give him an eight because he wasn't necessarily outstanding in terms of just being that threat up front but just put the you know just for the pure fact that he works hard for the team gets involved helps the cause showed great passion for the rivalry you know especially when you see him celebrating wolf goal wolf's goal um so the fact that he's got this you know he's got the ability he's got the pace got the energy got the passion everything about his game was fantastic and that's one of the main reasons i've given him a seven but personally for me a fantastic performance from him and although he probably won't get any credit from the game because he didn't score or didn't get an assist but I still do think in terms of his performances the fact that he's got that attacking intent and the fact that he goes back and defending that's really crucial parts of his game which are really nice to see so personally for me a great performance from Andres Townsend a 7 for him now to move on to our final player Wilfred Zaha who I'm going to give a 9 it had to be him with the final say on the big match putting Palace ahead early on and he made sure Palace were comfortable when he made it 3-1 with a rare but excellent finish with his head didn't stop running, top game from a top man. So Wilfred Zaha here, I've given him a 9, and as you've probably already seen from the highlights, this guy was absolutely fantastic on the day, and much like what I said in the 5 things we learned, this guy loves playing against Brighton because he scored the 2 goals in the playoff semi-final, he scored 2 goals here once again, and once again just proves why he's so much of a Palace legend, but also in terms of the context of this season, how much of a crucial player he is with the 2 goals he scored. No, of course, like I've said already, he obviously loves to score against Brighton. So, of course, it's quite obvious that he was going to have the big say on the match. And, of course, that's what he done here. You know, he put Palace ahead within the first five minutes really early on. The fact that we started the game so well and the fact that we got a goal early on was, of course, credit to the way the team started. We got straight off the blocks, played really well, and Zaha was crucial to that. And, of course, we were obviously... It, Brighton, when it was 2-0, Brighton got it back to 2-1. And obviously, Wilfred Zaha made sure it was comfortable, you know, scoring the goal after that fantastic ball over the top from Milivojevic. Obviously, he doesn't normally skip, score with his head, but he scored with his head there. Fantastic header uh, into the, you know, left-hand side of the goal. Fantastic effort there to make it 3-1. And obviously, that made us a bit more comfortable in the game. And of course, you know, much like Townsend, he didn't stop running in the game. was a complete attacking threat. And, you know, like I've said already, he's he's a legend in my eyes. You know, even if he does leave Palace in, you know, next season or the season after that, he will still be classed as a legend because he's almost got the most Premier League goals for Palace. He's he's up there with one of our, you know, top appearances. You know, now he's, he's slowly getting up there in terms of Premier League appearances. So slowly, slowly he's getting up there. But at the moment, with performances like this and, of course, scoring against our arch rivals, Brighton, of course, that's just making him more of a legend. And certainly... His top game was obviously just really epitomises how much of a top man he is. But in terms of his first half performance, you know, if we put the goals aside, he was awesome in that first half, you know, playing up front alongside Townsend. Obviously, they were confusing the back four with them changing from wide positions to narrow positions. But because of that, I thought they attacked really well. Because of that confusion, they were able to go forward and attack. And, you know, the fact that he scored two goals is, of course, great to see, you know, the first goal being a tap in just to make sure it can be you know go into the goal and of course the second one being a fantastic headed goal so not only is he proving you know the threat now he's got offensively he's now starting to show it and you know although people want to say he's got no end product just look at the goals and the assists he's got this season and especially the one here you know two fantastically 
uh, well taken goals and once again when he when he scored the goals you can see how much he cares how much he loves the club and of course you can see how much hatred he has for Brighton but in terms of the header you know I already said this already I think Ipswich is the only game other than Brighton he scored with a header before so obviously he's not really known for that for quite obvious reasons you know he's quite he's not the tallest player not really got the biggest physical ability so he's not really going to win all of the headers but the header here and the header in the playoff semi-final was of course they're two great headers and this one was probably you could argue even better but slowly slowly you know obviously this performance was so good in terms of the shooting chances the attacking chances he had and of course the two goals he had but in terms of his position he's looking more and more like a striker you know the more games he's playing in this sort of unorthodox uh, striker role where he's going out wide he drifts down the middle that seems to be working really well and slowly slowly even though he's a winger he's starting to slowly slowly look more like a striker and he's looking much more dangerous further up the pitch and of course in that more center role which is just showing that although he's playing in his unnatural position he's actually starting to mold to that position and showing that actually he can be dangerous in that area now of course in the second half he got a bit rattled you know a few of the Brighton players were putting in tackles left right and center and of course he, be he became a bit more subdued as a result of that because obviously Brighton players were tackling him left right and center it sort of affected his second half performance but realistically he scored the two goals in the first half made sure he celebrated so much because it meant so much to him so realistically the damage was already done for Brighton so although his performance was slightly worse in the second half I still thought that the damage was already done and once again you know them two goals you've just got to look back at it and say actually how crucial they were and how just much they prove how good of a player Zaha is but to be honest one of the main reasons he didn't have the best second half is just because of the service but because of that because obviously we were trying to protect our one goal lead at 3-2 we obviously didn't really attack that much as we did in the first half in second and because of that there was no service up to Zaha so that's why he was a bit subdued in the second half not because he was playing bad or the fact that he was exhausted after having such a good first half it's purely the fact that there was no service up to him which meant he couldn't attack the back four but to be honest for um you know in, ter in terms of the man of the match shortest of course he's going to be up there with one of the high nominations but in terms of just the two goals he scored alone even even if we lost the game for the two goals he scored in terms of how important they were that was of course great to see and certainly for me that does deserve him being on that shortlist but also in terms of helping him to player of the season he's certainly got to be up there you know most people are probably going to be voting for him but if he continues with performances like this he's slowly going to pull away from the likes of Tompkins and Milivojevic because that just shows how much of a world class talent he is uh, he is but if you look at the game in two halves yes the second half wasn't that great but for that first half alone he probably does deserve to get the man of the match award so personally for me an overall fantastic performance from him and a nine for him but to be honest you know you've got to look at him as a uh, you know as a whole what he's done in his palace career i've just got to say i love him you know this guy's a legend already in my eyes even if he does leave palace in a season or two to pursue bigger things I still love him I still think he's a legend and if he continues with performances like this not only obviously scoring against the rivals but but scoring crucial goals which are fantastically well taken then of course my love for him is going to grow even more but Wilfred Zaha here having you know having the say on the big match you know he said before the game he wants to put Brighton back to where they belong he's done exactly that with another good performance here you know two fantastic fantastically taken goal goals and once again, a good overall attacking performance. So I, I do think a 9 is a fair result. Now to move on to the subs. Christian Menteke and Jar Reedward. Now I'm not really going to give any of them ratings. You know, in J Reedward's case, you've got to look at the fact that he was only on the pitch for a few minutes. So you can't really give him a rating there. And in terms of Christian Menteke, because we were trying to protect our lead, we were playing quite deep. Which basically meant Menteke didn't have any service. Now, although people want to criticise him for not winning any of the headers or the aerial duels. He's been doing that quite a lot this season. And when you consider... He hasn't really got that much service. It's quite difficult for him to do that. So personally for me, although people want to criticise him, he came on for Kabai. Yes, he didn't do much, but that's purely because the, the service weren't good up to him. There was no balls coming up to him. And when you consider that, actually, yes, he may not have been having it all. He may not have had a great performance. I still do think it was a great time to bring on a sub. You know, you could see Kabai was getting a bit tired. And the fact that we didn't have a focal point in, a, in the attack... It was a perfect time to bring on um, Benteke. So I'm not necessarily moaning about the substitution. Because I think he was brought on at the right time. Just to sort of shore things up. But also I do think that actually. 
he didn't really have the service so really couldn't make an impact so I don't really think we could expect too much from him. In terms of Riedewald, he came on for Loftus Cheek, not really coming on the pitch to make an impact purely because, well, yeah, purely because obviously he was brought on to be that defensive midfielder just to shore things up, and he done exactly that. You know, that's what we wanted against Bournemouth. Roy Hodgson didn't make any substitutions, and we were a bit frail at the back and conceded in the last minute. Whereas here, we didn't make that same mistake again. We brought on a defensive midfielder, shored things up, and made sure we could hold on for the win, which is really important. So, of course, that was great to see. But of course, just to sort of give you a summary of the game, you know, this was the game we've all been waiting for. Not only in terms of a game that realistically could be really crucial in terms of our Premier League survival, but also when you consider we were locked out, knocked out in the FA Cup by Brighton back in January, it was, you know, it was really, you know, we've been waiting this time to actually get our own back. And it was worth, it was worth the wait when you consider that, you know, they beat us in the FA Cup. We had a nil-nil draw there. The fact that we've been waiting for this and we finally got the result and it was a fantastic game of football as well. It was really great to see. Now, of course, we took the game by the scruff of the neck from kickoff. You know, we started the game really fast, which is, of course, great to see. And, of course, our great start was rewarded with the two brilliant goals from Wilfred Zaha and one from James Tonkin. So we got what we deserved. We started the game straight off the blocks, played really well in the first sort of, yeah, 15 minutes because the, the what first goal was scored on five, the second one on 15. So the first 15 minutes, we started the game really fast. Yes, we conceded two goals, but of course we scored three more, and of course they were two, they were three brilliant goals, two from Wolf and one and one from Tompkins. But overall, I think the first half performance was superb, and it went a long way to sealing the three points in the derby. Because when you consider that, you know, it's all about, it's all about performances in terms of if you get a lead, you have to protect it. So when you consider how good that first half performance was, it went a long way to sealing the three points because we made sure we got the. We made sure that we got the, the lead in the first half and in the second half we made sure that we sealed it by having a solid performance in the second. So that was of course great to see and although you know the second half was slightly nervy it was, of it was of course great to see that we were able to go forth and seal the win. Now of course you know the, obviously Brighton have only this is their first season in the Premier League but they're still yet to beat Palace in the Premier League which is of course a great thing for us and in terms of the rivalry. But what the main thing really for me is yes you put the rivalry aside it was great to win and the way I'm looking at it is yes it was great to beat the rivals but the main thing for me is actually the three points because they could be really crucial in terms of the relegation battle because we're now as of this result we're now six points from safety with four games to go so realistically we could in the next few games secure safety if we get a few more points on the board but we've got four games left to play survival does remain in our own hands we shouldn't have to rely on other teams but if we have one more win like this and then we have more performances like this then then hopefully we can secure it so i'm now going to move on to my man of the match award but before i do that i give you my man of the match and why for the biggest influence in the game and now i'm going to give you the four nominations i put forward for the award so obviously after such a great performance in which we did dominate brighton for large amounts of the game you can understand there being quite a number of players who probably could be put up for the award. Now, the four players I've picked, maybe people necessarily won't agree with them, but in my personal opinion, these four players did stand out for me. Now, if you do disagree with the four players I picked and you think that I should have added players in or I missed players out, then of course do comment below or contact us on Twitter at Equal Palace so you can share your opinion there. But the four players I've put forward for the award are Wayne Hennessy, James Tompkins, Luka Milivojevic and Wilfred Zaha. Now before I go on to talk about them four players in particular, I'm just going to say, you know, I've already said it already, but loads of players miss out. You know, the likes of Ruben Loftus-Cheek and Andrus Townsend, who, whose offensive performances were fantastic. You know, Loftus-Cheek bringing that ball forward and Townsend's energy was great to see. And even the likes of McCarthy and Kabai miss out as well. You know, although we did win that midfield battle and they were crucial to it, I just think that the four players I picked out were just slightly better. Not to say that their McCarthy, Kabai, Townsend and Loftus-Cheek's performances were bad. I just personally think that the four players I picked, their performances were slightly better and they actually showed something to me which was actually quite crucial in moments of the game. So in terms of Wayne Hennessy, you know, you know, the one moment he had in the game, obviously he had an overall decent game, but the one thing was that fantastic save to get down low to deny Dale Stevens. You know, if it wasn't for that save, would have been back to 3-3 and who knows what would have happened then. So the fact that Hennessy made that important save as well as actually commanding his area, that's why he's on the shortlist, because if he hadn't have made these important saves, we would have ended up 
either drawing the game or going on to lose the game because Brighton will get momentum after scoring them goals. So in terms of the crucial, in terms of the importance, I suppose, of them saves from Hennessy, that's why he makes the shortlist. James Tonkins, you know, he was absolutely fantastic defensively and that's why he's on the shortlist. I always like to have a mixture between defenders, midfielders and attackers and James Tonkins, his defensive contribution and performance was fantastic and just to top that off, he obviously scored the goal to put us 2-0 up. So for the fact that he was so solid defensively and scored the goal, that's why he's on the shortlist. Luka Milivojevic, where to start with this guy? I gave him an 8 in the player ratings. He was absolutely fantastic. You know, he got the assist for Zaha's opener. A few moments later, or a few minutes later, he gets the assist for Zaha once again to make it 3-1. Both of them fantastic uh, assists. One of them from a corner. Nice little 1-2 with Lost's cheek. Puts the ball in, Zaha scores. The other one, a fantastic lofted ball which Zaha headed in. So once again, not only was Luka doing that defensive duty, which probably would have gotten him on the shortlist anyway, but the fact that he went above and beyond and put in two fantastic assists, that's the reason he makes the shortlist. And of course, Wilfred Zaha, the man of the moment, he obviously put us ahead, scored the first goal, scored the third goal as well, his second goal, one with his foot, which was a tap-in from Milivojevic, is crossed into the area, and the other one from his lofted ball forward, a fantastic header. So, of course, we knew... Zaha is going to pose a threat and he always likes scoring against Brighton but the fact that he was able to score the quality of goals that he did and have so much attacking influence on the game was fantastic to see as well and like I said at the end of the play ratings it was a top game from a top man once again but like I've said with all of these players they, sh they stood out for me for certain things they've done in the game but also their performance as well but personally for me I do think it is a no you know non -brain no brainer you know when you consider someone scored two goals against your bit of rivals they also played pretty good for the rest of the game i think it's quite obvious for me to give it to wilfred zaha so congratulations uh, wilfred you don't get a trophy or certificate but you do get my sincere congratulations on what was once again a fantastic solid performance from you but the thing that made it even better is the fact that despite all the stick all of the brighton fans were giving you before the game you were able to put them back in their place with a fantastic performance and of course score two more goals against brighton like you always like to do so personally for me zaha just stood out for me because of the influence he had offensively on the game and the fact that he scored two goals. But, you know, the players I've put there in terms of Hennessy making that save, Tompkins scoring the goal, being defensively solid. And in terms of Milivojevic actually just being that rock in front of the back four and in terms of his attacking contribution, in terms of his two assists, I do think that these guys do deserve on the shit, or, uh, to be on the shortlist. But I do think that Zaha just pimps it for me. But do comment below with your views and like I said at the beginning you know special mentions to Loftus, Cheek, Townsend, MacArthur and Kabai because I could have put any of them four on the shortlist as well but personally for me I do think that these four players do deserve the shortlist. So now you've heard my match report, player rankings and my man match that concludes this week's podcast. Now I've got interviews with Roy Hodgson, Wilfred Zaha, James Tonkins and Wayne Hennessy following the game. Wilf, what's your reaction to that incredible game? Um, I don't even know what to say, I'm just buzzing we managed to get the win as I said before. I don't. I didn't want to talk too much. Let's just get the game over and done with, because I I knew we were better than them, and we obviously proved it today. And you did you talking with your feet and your head as well? Exactly. I bet no one expected me to score with my header, with my head anyway. But I'm buzzing that I managed to score two goals and we managed to get the the massive three points. How good was that ball in from Luca for your second goal? Well, to be honest, I'm I'm not surprised because he's got that quality, but. I didn't really expect him to do like do the ball as I made the run, but I wasn't and he managed to do it. Fellow, um, you were all over Brighton in the in the first half at three one. Do you think at that point, because there was so much noise from the crowd getting behind you, maybe when you should have stepped back a bit, you were going for it a bit too much, and that's how they got it back. Yeah, I think two 0 up, and the way we scored so quickly, everyone got a bit too relaxed, like taking a bit longer to pass the ball and. Slack passes, losing the ball. I think that's what that's what messed us up a bit. But obviously, second half now, we we knew we had to just tighten up and see the game through. Did you feel nerves? Um, yeah, at times, because obviously they had spells where they were all over us. But I think we had it in us to to get the win today, and I'm happy. And finally, big derby day win. How are you gonna celebrate this weekend? Um, I don't know really. I'm exhausted, so I'm just going to chill out, chill out with my son and just watch TV, really, nothing else to really do. James, that was an incredible game. What was it like to play in? 
<laughs> I don't know what it was like to watch, but planning was, um, you know, it was nerve wracking at times. I'm not going to lie. Uh, you know, we go three one up, and then you think it's going to be all sailing home, and then you know you concede one, and it changes the game completely. Uh, you know, from us to concede that goal before half time, it gives them a lift, and um, that's not what we wanted to do. <laughs> we won it the hard way, but you know, it's three points nonetheless, and obviously over the moon, really. Yeah, and going back to the start, I haven't heard noise like that at Sellers in ages. What was it like for you? Yeah, you can, the place is rocking. That's probably the loudest I've heard it as well. Um, you know, I knew before I come here the fans were good and that, and you know, people were saying how good they are, and you know, to only. You only sort of realise when you're a player and they're rocking like that just to see how much they are. They are so loud and what they mean to us, really, because you know, with them today, they sort of helped us through it. And what do you think the secret was between the the great start? Um, you know, we've we've done that a, a few times, um, especially you know when the crowd are rocking. And, you know, we go two goals up quite quickly, and we look like we could get a third or a fourth. Um, and then they concede when they probably didn't deserve one. But, you know, that's football and that seems to happen a lot to us recently. So, uh, you know, it's just nice to sort of put the game to bed in the end of it, you know, and keep that sort of clean sheet in the second half, which we needed to do because we knew we were going to win if we kept that clean sheet in the second half. And talk us through your, your goal. Good reactions. Yeah, um, for some reason, I've, it seems to be a bit slow motion, I think. Uh, I thought the referee was going to blow for something. I don't know what, but it's in the back of my head and I just thought about hitting it with my left foot as well. And... <laughs> people say it and out, but it's, it's, you know it's had to kept it low, and you know I just wanted to see you know the net uh, net bulge and uh, went through so many bodies it felt like and uh, seemed to be ages until it went in, but uh, you know it's a it's a nice goal. Wayne, that was as an incredible game, um, two totally different halves, wasn't it? Yeah, um, like saying I thought we played very well first half, but little Serie A the Acosta's basically got obviously the two goals in, but like saying second half I thought we. Dug deep and yeah, it was a good performance. What was it like being being stood behind the defence? So many balls coming into the box. Yeah, they're a team that t technically, obviously, when they're losing, they they send the big man forward, put a load of balls in, and like saying Glenn Murray's so good in the air as well. So, but I thought the boys coupled with it very well. And the manager specifically said it was your best game since he's been manager. How do you feel your performance was? Yeah, I felt very good. Um, obviously, no goalkeeper likes to concede two goals. Um, like I say, we'll have a look at that, but. Yeah, I thought I played very well and yeah, it's obviously nice to get that three points. And Wilf always plays well against Brighton, doesn't he? Yeah, fantastic. Um, we're so pleased with how Will's playing at the moment. Um, he's a massive player for us and hopefully he can stay fit now to the rest of the season. What was it like in the dressing room afterwards? I heard some, some cheesy pop tunes coming out of that. Yeah, that Andros Townsend, his uh, iPhone got played, which I don't think we'll ever allow that to be played again. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the cheesiest songs you've ever heard, so that's a complete stop from now on. Well, I don't think I've quite recovered from that yet. What was <laughs> no, it like for you? No, we died a thousand deaths near the end there after the, the first half where I thought we played so well and were so dominant. It was a bit strange to come in with only a one-goal advantage and to have conceded two goals from really very, very few opportunities that Brighton had actually created. It was, it was all us. But second half, that disappeared. We didn't produce the same quality of football in the second half as we had done in the first half. And... Once again, the tension starts to mount and you, you start being aware of the clock ticking and the fact that you're still in the lead and how important the three points are. Defenders start to drop a little bit deeper. The clearances are a little bit more panicky than they were in the first half. And this is, unfortunately, what being at the bottom of the league is, is like. And the thing that's really given me great encouragement today is that even in that situation when... Brighton played much better. They mounted a challenge. They've got some very big players, so those long balls forward in, into the box from crosses are always going to be a problem. We really stood up to it very well. Our goalkeeper today was outstanding. That's the best he's played since I've come to the club, without a shadow of a doubt. And when we really needed him to step up to the plate, he did. And uh, when we needed people to show that determination and cling on and get the victory, which the fans, of course, crave and which is so important to us if we can have a chance in the next four games, we succeeded in doing it. So I'm, I'm more than satisfied, but uh, certainly for my blood pressure and my heart, it wasn't the, the, the greatest second half I've lived through. But then no one ever said this game should be easy. No one ever said that we coaches and managers should have an easy time of it.
So there you have it. Now you've heard what Roy Hodgson, Wilfred Zaha, James Tompkins and Wilfred Zaha had to say after the game. That concludes this week's podcast for the game against Brighton. But make sure to comment next week for my post-match review of the game against Watford. So thanks for listening and remember to up the palace. I don't stop, I don't stop, I don't stop.